Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. We're blessed that you can join us here, here being in the northwest of England, in the Man greater Manchester area. We're in Saddleworth. Back in the saddle back, again. Back in the Saddleworth again, yes, hallelujah. Um, we're continuing on in our look in the Sermon on the Mount, and for the past three weeks, I guess it is, three or uh, three programs, mm -hmm. we've been talking about the tradition of men, the tradition of the elders, and the Word of God, yes. okay? Yes. Uh, you know, Jesus said how said to religious leaders, the Pharisees, he said, how nicely you set aside the commandment of God to hold fast to your traditions. Well, you see, it's, that's kind of an either-or. The traditions that they were teaching that were not the Word had to replace the Word. It's one or the other. They don't go together. And we're, we're going to see that now as we continue on in the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus says over and over, he says a half dozen times, you have heard it said, you have heard that the ancients were told, you have heard it said, but I say to you. So what he's doing is he is dealing with what the people have come to believe because it's what the people have been taught. It has become the tradition of men that is not the word of God. It's not the heart of God. So that's what we're going to deal with starting today. Hallelujah. But before we do that, I just want to ask Father that you would that you would open our eyes to understand this great yes. more greatly, Lord God. You, that we would understand the difference between your heart, your word, Lord God, mm. and what men have taught for so long. And that is not the word. The traditions that have been built up around mm. religion. Lord, that we might truly be set free to, to serve you, to worship you, to live in the fullness of your spirit, Lord God. So we praise you and thank you for this time in your word, Lord, and ask that you open our eyes that we might see wonderful things in your word. Father, and I just ask that in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. All right, we're going to start, as I said, and we're going to be in the fifth chapter of Matthew in the Sermon on the Mount. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to start, I think, in verse 21. All righty. One of the things I said, you know, when, when we came out of the tomb like Lazarus, we came wrapped in the clothing of death. Right. Unlike Jesus, who left it all behind when he came out of the tomb, right? Mm -hmm. So now we're going to look at a situation where we have been redeemed from the curse of the law. Yes. Which impossibly requires us to give so much. We've been moved to the freedom of the Holy Spirit, which empowers us to give all. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. From the time you were an infant, you were trained. Now, I think very few of us have had the blessing of like John the Baptist, who came out of, out of his mother's womb filled with the Holy Spirit, all right? Mm -hmm. So we came out, we, we learned things, and in spite of the fact that it is a part of the highest command of God in Deuteronomy, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, that, that fathers are supposed to be teaching their children, training their children in the Word of God all the time. And bring, parents are supposed to be bringing their children up in the ways of the Lord, the ways they should go. Mm -hmm. The simple fact of the matter is that that hasn't been the case, the case no. generally speaking. Right. So what we have learned are traditions of men. We have learned the ways of the world which it says in Jeremiah that we are not we do. to do, but we have, all right? Mm -hmm. And it's not just the world that's done that teaching. All too often, it's been the religious leaders that have done that training, bringing about teachings of the tradition of men rather than the word and the heart of God. So that's why now, and bear in mind that here in the Sermon on the Mount, and we talked about this in the introduction, that this is Jesus, he has for the first time gathering his disciples, naming his apostles, and now what he is doing is he is training them in righteousness, in preparation for sending them out into the world to be that light unto the world, to be the salt of the earth that shows forth the glory of God. Right? Right. You know, Paul wrote to Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3, 3, 6. He says, all scripture is God-breathed and profitable. One of the things it's profitable for is training in righteousness. Mm -hmm. So this is Jesus training us in righteousness. Now, understand that the moment you accepted the saving work of Jesus Christ in your life, the atoning work of Jesus on the cross, you were made righteous. Yes. 
very righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, because you were made right with God the Father. Hallelujah. Yes. But now we have to be trained in that righteousness, mm -hmm. trained to walk and live in that righteousness. Praise God. So what Jesus is saying, and I'll start in Matthew 5, 21. He said, you have heard that the ancients were told, you shall not commit murder. And whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. Well, that's the word of God. That's the law. That's the law. So he says, and now, he says, but I say to you. Mm -hmm. So is he changing this? No, he's not changing anything. The word of God is unchanging. Grass withers the fowl of face, but the word of God stands forever. But Jesus Christ is the word, and he is the same yesterday, today, and yes, forever. So he says, but I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And goes on. You're going to have to read these verses as we go, right? The point is, Jesus is searching the heart. God searches the heart. Man looks at outward appearance. And anger in our heart to God is the same as murder. Because that's where murder emanates from, right? Everything is going to emanate from your heart, mm -hmm. right? With the heart man believes, right. not the brain. Right. That's why it's important to remember that, you know, when we were, you, born, you, when, when we were formed, when we were formed, and Alice just read this the other day mm -hmm. in, in a scientific journal, mm -hmm. the first organ that is formed in a, in a new fetus is the heart, right? right? With the heart man believes. You can get stuff into your brain. I can put stuff in your brain. Movies can put things into your brain. Music can put things into your brain. The world can put things into your brain. There's good and there's bad. But it takes the Holy Spirit to take what is good that's going into your brain, the Word, and move it into your heart. That it becomes the reality of your belief. Because what you believe... Rules you. That's what our, our dear old brother... Uncle Arthur Burt used to say. But I like to say what you believe will determine your choices. And what you choose will determine your life. So if you have anger in your heart, Jesus is saying to him, that's the same as murder. Mm -hmm. That is the same thing. Okay. So what's happened now, as I said. But he's giving us understanding. He has given us understanding of this. Of what, of what the law was saying. Because if you have that anger in your heart. There is not that love in your heart. That's right. And as I said, what we're looking for is the royal law of love. Okay? He goes on to say, you've heard, you've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. Well, but you're not supposed to commit adultery. You're not supposed to commit murder. Right. Not being under the law any longer. Being set free from the curse of the law doesn't give you liberty to do whatever you want. It gives you the freedom to live the heart of God, the, di the desires of God. It gives you the power to do that. Okay? So it's, 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 it's becoming stronger. Okay? It's not just murder. It's anger. It's not just adultery. It's looking on a woman with lust. Because we've been given a new heart, that heart of flesh. Amen. Into which the love of God has been poured through the Holy Spirit. And upon which has been written the, the words of God. Right? Amen. So it's like it's going from being, a t uh, being tough. <laughs> and virtually impossible to being more demanding but more possible because not by power nor by might but by my spirit saith the Lord he has put his spirit in you you are the temple of the Holy Spirit and now you have the power of the spirit gives you the power within you to live the heart of God Amen. that's not, important that's very right. important I guess it's very important mm -hmm. Because you try to do it on your own, and you're you can't gonna fail every single time. That, because the flesh doesn't have the power no. to do this. No. But the Spirit of God within you has, all right? That's why everybody who's being led by the Spirit is the children of God. Okay. Yes. Okay. Let me just um, read down a little bit. Mm -hmm. You've heard that, in verse uh, 33, you've heard that the ancients were told, you shall not make false vows, but shall fulfill your vows to the Lord. But I say to you, make no oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is the footstool of his feet, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Now, one of the things about this is, we are to be like Christ. It says, you know, Ephesians 5.1, we're, we're, therefore, we're the beloved children, we're to be imitators of God as beloved children, right? One of the things that we're supposed to do here, 
is watch over our word to perform it. Is that not the pro is that what God does? God yes. watches over his word yes, to perform it. If we're to be like him, then we need to we need to watch over our word to perform it. You know, when I was younger, it was common people did deals, made agreements based on a handshake. Mm -hmm. Well, in in the times that I have lived in, it became so men's word became so unreliable mm -hmm. that it had to go to written contracts. And today, written contracts have little value. Yes. I mean, they're broken they're constantly. Broken. They're broken yes. constantly. Mm -hmm. What you say, you are responsible for. You're responsible for every careless word that comes out of your mouth. Your word has to be your bond. It's not a matter that it wasn't a contract, a written contract. You need to watch over your word to perform it, which means that before you make a commitment to anybody, before you make say something to somebody, you need, this is, you need to think about it. Mm -hmm. Count the cost. And, and, well, it's not just count the cost. You know, you need to consider whether what you're saying is realistic or not. Right. I mean, sometimes we make unrealistic promises. So, so we need to do that, and that's why you have to be slow to speak yes. and quick to listen, yes. all right? If you give your word to somebody, do it. Now, I know there can be times when it becomes impossible, well, praise God. God, you know, that, that's understandable for us. Mm -hmm. However, if you give your word, I don't care what it costs you to do it. You know, if you make a deal with somebody for a certain amount of money, and all of a sudden you find out, well, it's a little of this or this, you know what? You need to be willing and ready to do the deal based on what you what your word. Even if it, even if it means loss to you. Mm -hmm. Because your word is more important than your dollars. And what he says here about making the vow, he said, let your answer... Be yes, yes. Yes, yes. Or, or no, no, no. Because where there are many words, transgression is unavoidable. That's absolutely true. Absolutely true. Um, I, I think, you know, I know of one place where today most business is still done simply based on a word. Yes. And it's interesting because it's typically among the Orthodox Jews mm -hmm. who work in the Diamond Center in New York City. Right. I mean, here are people that do million dollar, multi million dollar transactions mm -hmm. daily. And yet, there's no signed contracts. Mm -hmm. I don't even know if there's a handshake. Mm -hmm. They say muzzle. They speak. They speak. Mm -hmm. And it's a done deal. Because if they, if they break that word, they'll never do business again. Mm -hmm. We need to have that same heart of God that if we say something, we do it. Right. This is important. And that made, just made me think that when God spoke, when he speaks a word, it's already done. It's a done deal. Right? Absolutely. So it's imitating yeah. him. Well, that's what we're supposed to do. Right. Okay. Um, in verse 38, it says, you, you have heard it was said. Where do they hear these things? Well, I, they, again, they heard it from the teaching of the religious people. Mm -hmm. If it was the word of God, it's not that God is changing it. It's that he, we didn't understand it. All right. right. We didn't understand it. We didn't understand the heart of God. You know when we did? You know when we found out what love was? It says we know love by this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That is supposed to be the key to understanding. Right. It goes right? back to the cross. It always goes back to the to the cross. Yeah. You have heard it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist him who is evil. But whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn to him the other also. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your coat also. Mm -hmm. Whoever for shall force you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks of you and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. This is so contrary to what you have been trained yes. to do. Yes. That's what's so contrary. What you, you know what you were trained to do? You were trained to take revenge. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Now we understand. Jesus hung on that cross. Showing us love. Looking at the people that just nailed him to the cross, mm -hmm. looking across time to all of the ones like you and I, whose sin was nailed to that cross and why he was nailed to that cross. And he said, Father, forgive them. That's the heart of God. And that's what he is revealing to us and giving us understanding of here in the Sermon on the Mount. That's what he's empowered us to do. But it goes against everything that you have been trained Absolutely. to do, both by the world and typically by religion mm -hmm. for the last thousands of years, okay? Right. You've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Mm -hmm. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. How good are we doing with that? 
I mean, we live in times when they're, when the enemies are very visible. I mean, do I need to talk about ISIS and Al-Qaeda and all of the terrorist groups? How much do you hate them? <laughs> and you know, this, well, is, this is the verse that when, it, when you've done Bible studies on, that people have the most difficulty. Absolutely, with. absolutely. Well, this and and forgiving people right. that offended you and hurt you. But pray for their en pray for enemies. They 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 really resistant to that. Bless those who curse you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't. When I say this, when Jesus said this, it doesn't make those enemies good people. It makes us have a good heart right. to pray for them. You know, Paul, Paul clarifies that in his 12th chapter of Romans. When he says, you know, if, if somebody does evil to us, if your enemy does that to you, you know, you're not to take your own vengeance. And it's not going to feel good. Because it's not about feelings. That's exactly It's not right. about feelings. That's it's right. about obedience in the Spirit. And he says, you know, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If your enemy is thirsty, give him something to drink. You're to bless those who curse you. But it says, just in the verse before where Paul starts that, he says, Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. He'll repay. He'll repay. Yes. He'll take care of these things. And God has given, like, like with ISIS, God has given the government out in the world mm. a ministry. Yes. He's given them the ministry of the sword to protect, protect us from evildoers. We don't have that ministry of, of that sword in the yeah. world. We have a ministry of reconciliation. Yes. To proclaim the truth of the love and the word of God to all who are sinners. Paul wrote that. Paul, my goodness, you talk about enemies of the church. I mean, his life was dedicated to the persecution of the church before that road to Damascus experience. This is where we have to go with this. We have to get to that place where it is the love of God that drives all of our actions. That's not what you heard when you were growing up. Yeah. Unless you are the exception to the rule. But it's, it certainly is what you are hearing from Jesus in his word, okay? Amen. Before I go on, I want to, want to say something here. I, there's, there's purpose to everything that God does. Yes, absolutely. Okay? Yes. There is always purpose. So, you know, think about what he is saying here. Starting from blessed are the poor in spirit, mm -hmm. in the beginning of the, of the Sermon on the Mount. Right down to here where he's saying, you know, you love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Mm -hmm. What's the purpose of all this? To make this a nicer world? It's not going to make it a nicer no. world. No, this present world, this earth is reserved for destruction by fire. Yes. It's going to get worse. Read what Jesus said in Matthew 24 and you'll find that it's going to get worse and worse. Read what Paul says in, in 2 Timothy chapter 3. You know, we, we have, we are, these are perilous times and they're going to get more perilous. But God has a purpose in these words. Yes. You know what the purpose is? Well, go to the end of this chapter. Yes. Matthew 5, 48. And he says to these disciples, to these apostles, he says, Therefore, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. You see, it's this that leads us to that perfection. That's God's purpose, is to perfect us. He is the potter and we are the clay, and he is molding us and shaping us. He is cleansing us. He is putting us through the fire that the impurities might rise to the surface where he can take them off. Mm -hmm. That's why Job said, I know that when I've been tried, it shall come forth as gold. You know, perfection is the goal. Yes. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to be, and the next week you're going to be a perfect person or not. Even the Apostle Paul said that he had not achieved perfection yet. Right. But I promise you, it needs to be our heart's desire and our goal. That we be perfect, even as our Heavenly Father is perfect. You know, Alice and I, a few years back, we were out in the Dallas area. And we were in a, a, a large, a large church just outside of Dallas. And I, this, I'd never been there before. Somebody uh, invited us to go with them to this church. And mm -hmm. the pastor made a point. They have two services on Sunday morning. And he made a point of saying in this first service that, I, I, guess I, I find this hard to say, he made a point of saying he didn't buy this sermon on the, off the internet, right. which apparently he generally does. He said, God gave him this sermon. And he went on in his 20-minute sermon. It has to be 20 minutes no longer because you've got another crowd coming in. Mm -hmm. um, that he, that we, don't, we shouldn't look for perfection because it, puts, you know, it makes us, we lose our self-esteem when we can't achieve that perfection. I was astounded 
I mean, here's, here's this pastor speaking to these hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people, saying, you know, God doesn't want you to try to be perfect. So after the sermon, I walked straight up to him, and I said to him, speaking the truth in love, I said to him, I, do you remember that Jesus said that we are to be perfect, even as our Heavenly Father is perfect? And he looked at me. I mean, I'm six inches away from him. And he, said, he looked at me and he said, well, I'm glad to see that somebody still has his yield for the word. And turned and walked away from me. The word of God is the word of God. Yes. <clears throat> Too many religious leaders have compromised and are now teaching the traditions of men. We need to be on guard. Yes. We need to be on guard. Don't allow the word to be compromised in your life. Yes, what Jesus is preaching here in the Sermon on the Mount is harder than the law was. It's not about murder. It's about anger. It's not about adultery. It's about lust. It's people come out and say, you know, you, should I tithe? Should I tithe? Do God want me to give 10%? No, I said, God doesn't want you to give 10%. He wants you to give it all. Give it all. He said, no man can be a disciple unless he gives up all his possessions. Talk about the Sabbath. Now, listen, I know what it says in Romans 14, and if you don't, go read it after this. About the Sabbath. Are we to, are we to you know, keep the Sabbath? That's, that's a major debate through, through, through much of Christianity. Are we to keep it? Why would you not keep the Sabbath? Okay. Because you've lost sight, and you heard what the Pharisees were teaching. So Jesus said to them, Man was not made for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath was made for man. It was intended from the beginning to be a blessing to man. It was to be a time of rest, a refreshing. Amen. So what day is that? Well, if you read Isaiah 58, you might find out that it's every day. Amen. You might find out that it's every day. Because we are to learn to rest in the Lord. Yes. I don't care how busy you are in the world. You can learn to rest in the Lord and have that Shabbat. You can have that Shabbat Shalom, that rest of uh, peace, all the time. The word has never been a curse no. until we walked in the flesh. Mm -hmm. Walking in the spirit. That's why Paul says the law, Jesus didn't cancel the law. He didn't kick it out. He fulfilled it. Mm -hmm. And then he taught here in the Sermon on the Mount that you know, anybody that teaches otherwise, well, you're going to be in trouble with God. It was the understanding of, of the letter of the law that kills. as opposed that kills as opposed to the spirit of the law, which blesses life. All God's word is intended to be a blessing. Amen. We need to be on guard against those traditions, what we've been taught by the world, and the teachings of the world that have snuck in, crept in, and been well accepted with inside the church of God. We need to be praying for understanding. You know, that's, that's what I was saying before about the yes. difference between revelation and understanding. We've been given revelation. We need understanding. And that's what it says in Proverbs, that we should be seeking understanding. But by the way, none of this, you know, it, it's not supposed, you don't have to be, uh, you don't have to be a Bible scholar and have a doctor of divinity to be able to understand the word of God. If it was, I mean, that's, God has not chosen many of the wise in this world. That's what it says, all right? That's right? His word is easy. It is simple. Some people lack understanding of God's word for the very simple reason, and this is what Jesus said, because they're not willing to do it. Right. Hear yeah. and obey. Right. You would know that it's from God if you were willing to, to do, do it. it. And then, you know, it is hear and obey. You have to hear God's word, and then you have to do God's word. And as you start to do what God has spoken, I tell you, it becomes clearer and clearer. Amen. All right? You know, it says that in, in Isaiah, that darkness covers the earth and deep darkness the people. That deep darkness, if you look at the Hebrew there, it's like a fog. It's like a, a wet darkness. It's, mm -hmm. And it, if you go into a, a stadium, a football stadium, and it's pitch, absolutely pitch black dark, and light one candle, and there's 85,000, well, 85,000 people's oh, eyes are going to turn to that one candle. Yes. But if you got on the road and it's foggy out, you can turn on bright lights and you know what? It just doesn't penetrate. It just bounces back on you. That's right. So we're coming to that time of that deep darkness. But God is the light. Is the light. Amen. And it can clear away all darkness. Mm. The darkness cannot stand before the light of the Lord. God wants us to have understanding. You know why? 
so that we can walk in, live in His Word, abide in His Word, and we will know the truth. We'll truly be His disciples. We'll know the truth, and the truth shall make us free. Our goal is perfection. And His goal was that freedom. He said in His first speaking, right, in the synagogue, He said, He came to set the captives free. free. We were captive to the traditions of men. We were captive to the teachings of the world. And this is Jesus Christ setting us free. He's not being more demanding. He is setting us free from the curse of the law. He is setting us free from being under the law. And setting us free to be in the Spirit. Amen. To be in Christ Jesus. Okay. Okay. I say to you, I want to read this again, Matthew 5, 44. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, in order that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. Think about that. If you are not praying for your enemies, if you are not praying for those evil people out there, praying for those evil people out there, the enemies of God, the enemies of us, then are you truly... Sons of your Father who is in heaven. He said, this is what makes you. This is where you might be, sons of your Father who is in heaven. I have been so troubled and so burdened. First of all, I'm burdened. When I, it's, it's a horrible thing to see what terrorism is going on in the world. I mean, you know, we, we've just arrived in England just a few weeks ago, having traveled through, through Spain and France. I want to tell you, we saw the demonstrations about the immigration and the problems. Mm -hmm. in, in the incredible security in Barcelona, mm -hmm. in Paris, and in London. We, we live in troubled times, perilous times, what, is what Paul calls them. The world has to deal with that. We have to deal by pouring out the love of God. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to remind you one more time. Paul was a great enemy of the church. Paul was a chosen vessel of of God. There may be people in ISIS out there right now mm. who are chosen vessels of God. Yeah. There may be people there wearing turbans and cloaks whose name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, but they have yet to hear that saving word of God's grace. We need to be praying for them. We need to be praying for our enemies. The world is responsible. They have, like I said, they have the sword. They are responsible for dealing with the evildoers to protect us. But our ministry is a ministry of reconciliation. Our ministry is to show forth the love and the light of God Almighty. Hallelujah. Thank you. Jesus. And Father, I thank you that you've given us the power to do that. That unlike Pharaoh, who required your people, Lord God, to do things and then did not equip them to do it, you don't call us to love without having poured your love into our hearts. You don't call us to walk in the Spirit without having made us a temple of the Holy Spirit. Everything that you have called us to do, Lord God, you have equipped us to do. Yes. You have given us the boldness. We don't need to pray for boldness. You have given it to us. We don't have a spirit of timidity. We have that sound mind and that boldness. Lord, help us to walk in it for the glory of your name and so others might know of your glory. We praise you and thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Well, until next time. God bless you and goodbye. So I cherish that old rugged cross till my trophy.